Welcome friends online. Hi, happy you're here with us. And can I, I, I did see a couple of new folks. Who's new here tonight? Raise your hand. Yay, we love you, welcome. So this is the Wednesday Well of Being and every Wednesday night we gather here together in practice of meditation, but also, and maybe more importantly, in practice of community. And that includes being able to talk about the teachings together, practice together, and work on this essential quality of really fortifying ourselves in non-harming. And it's a funny way of saying compassion or kindness, but when you look at the direct translation of kind of the foundational ethic of Buddhist practice, especially, it's just this aspiration to not harm, but to not harm at every level. So not just that you're not gonna inadvertently whack someone next to you when you meditate, let's hope, okay? If you do, you can apologize, but that non-harming that is in body, speech, and mind. So when we gather here together, it's our physical posture, like Ulysses helping with a chair, that's an act of non-harming for those of us who have back issues and wanna sit in a chair. Then also the aspect of non-harming through speech. That's not only what we will say, this is a, an evening where we encourage folks to share and reflect on their practice, ask questions about the teachings. So speaking in a way that's not harming. And what does that mean? Well, I think it's always nice to have a reminder that when we are speaking and sharing in a collective space to share what feels as though it's reasonable for others to be able to hold, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes people come up to me after and they said, I didn't think I could share this with the whole group, but I'd love to ask you this. That is such a beautiful non-harming, right? Recognizing it may not be for the whole group, right? That's one way. And then our speech also non-harming is, you know, learning how to share space. There are so many amazing lived experiences in this room, so many opportunities to hear from people. So thinking about that as we communicate with one another. And maybe the hardest part of our non-harming of speech is the inner speech. Can anybody commit here to, yeah. He's the, oh, is there another chair? Oh, sweet. Welcome. To really commit for the next hour and a half to the least amount of self-criticism and self-judgment possible. Anybody in for that? It's an aspiration. There's no, no one's gonna check your homework at the end, but like what a cool opportunity to be here together and commit. For this hour and a half, I'm gonna really reduce all the harm from my inner speech by making it really kind and compassionate to myself. It's hard to do. We don't control our minds. That's why you're all here. <laughs> we did, you go about your way, everything would be fine. But what arises, what proliferates in the mind is often things that are kind of stressful or negative or downright bullying, right? So taking that aspiration or that intention to be non-harming in our inner speech in this whole time. And then non-harming in the mind. I think one of the most beautiful ways to do that is infuse the mind with a sense of light, with a sense of kindness, compassion. That's my job. I will give some instructions towards that for you all and ways to start training the mind so it can settle, rest, and open. So that's our agreements for being here together. Does that sound reasonable, friends? Yes. All right. And as this is always in an evolving community, it's really our aspiration that people can come here and feel safe and supported. And if there are ways that we can improve that, please let us know by any means. It might not feel the easiest to just raise your hand right now. Maybe you let us know by a note or otherwise. We had a wonderful um, participant with us a couple of weeks ago who shared, you know, it really, it really helps me to settle into a space first time I'm in the space by being able to look around mm -hmm. and really being able to name and mention what's going on. So I just, I love that kind of feedback so that we can really know how to support one another in this space. And for, especially folks who are new, definitely take a moment and in a um, non-searching, like not looking out, but like look around your space. This is where we are here together and 
I got the walls, the ceilings. I got Serana watching the door. We're so safe here, right? So just to get a sense of the space, get a sense of, yeah, there's other beings in this room, hopefully with the same intention of coming together for practice. And for folks online, of course, looking, I think you can only see me, but imagining your whole community here with you. <clears throat> and especially when you're practicing at home to have a freshness of your space. It could be the same space where you've been working all day. So see if you can feel it as though it were new, really have a sense of the ambient space in the room. And <clears throat> we have been working through this just stunningly beautiful text by Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, who is a teacher in the Ban tradition. So this is the indigenous uh, tradition of Tibet that is Buddhist, but also has kind of other elements wrapped into it from that more animist, if you want to call it that way, approach. And this very simple and short book invites us to call from the natural essences of the world. So we've already done earth and water, Tonight, we're going to do fire, which is great. Yes. <laughs> That's good. That's good. And calling in these natural essences to help us with a process that he calls soul retrieval. And what are we retrieving our soul from? It's a contracted sense of pain identity. And the pain identity is when we identify with lack and deficiency. You know, that feeling of it's never enough, a feeling like we need to constantly be distracting ourselves because there's something we don't want to be. We don't want to feel. We don't want someone else to know about us. And this sense of our kind of pain identity, he so beautifully describes also as the kind of pain body. Right? We can kind of feel that dullness and that heaviness. And that's why I'm so delighted that tonight we work with fire. Because fire is really such a different quality. And the way he describes fire is it's our joy. It's our inspiration. You know, it's this vitality. So when we've been working with, with earth and with water, I've invited us to think about and make dates with the mountain, right? The park, the backyard. Also to really have that sense of flow that could be in, you know, in the shower or in water that you feel somewhat safe in. We have a number of big wave surfers in the Sangha, not that kind of water necessarily, not the big crushing water, but that water that makes you feel flow movement. And with fire, right? Just imagining the way he describes it is, you know, that sense of the fire of a bonfire dancing around that fire. And I can even imagine just the way the flames dance, right? Just that sense of, almost absorption. Like when there is a fire, you're not like, where am I going to look? You're like, <laughs> right? like, it's like all this time, right? Like, oh, I look at the fire. It's so absorbing. There's such a vitality of being around that. So that's the quality that we're going to call in. After our practice, we'll talk a bit more about fire. I, I had some inspiration around thinking, especially about this quality and, and how we could invite it into our life. One of the other key features of this teaching by Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche is the three precious pills. So I said, part of our agreements of being here together is having our body, speech, and mind in non-harming. And he gives us very simple, very beautiful instructions in how to settle our body, speech, and mind. He invites us to settle our body in a quality of stillness. And before we begin, I want us to kind of recalibrate our stillness. One thing he really suggests for us is it's not something that we need to like search for and try and hold on to. Like, okay, I'm going to get stillness, ah, stillness in the body. He really invites us to feel it quite naturally. So here we are, those of us in the room and, and likely online, not moving. Like we're not going anywhere. So there's kind of that quality of stillness. But there's this other layer of noticing the stillness that's just always already there. 
Mm. So taking a moment and just seeing if there is a way to connect and feel this invitation to draw upon the quality of stillness. I love that everybody fidgets when I say that. <laughs> there is still stillness while you fidget, no problem. And the same with silence, right? When we move towards the quality of silence, and that's settling the inner speech. There's still thoughts, there's still sounds. We might have a car blaze by momentarily with some very loud music, but we can still orient towards or find the presence of silence. I like that for stillness and silence, it's, it's a choice, it's a preference. What are we prioritizing in our focus? What are we allowing to be revealed, which is always already there? And then naturally, when there's a quality of stillness and silence, we settle our mind and heart into warmth and openness. That sense not only that there is a vast, unbounded space of awareness, but that that vast unbounded space of awareness is warm, kind. So those are our precious pills. And now that we've touched them just briefly, we're going to move into practice and settle into them a bit more. So we'll be practicing about 25 minutes or so. Please find a posture that is supportive for you. I can be sitting, I can be lying down. It's really nice to orient your posture towards practice. And there's some simple instructions that are classically given. It's nice to really feel the stable base of the body. So whether you're sitting in a chair or on the floor, really making sure you can feel the support of the ground beneath you. So for those of us in a chair that might be wiggling your toes and really feeling your heels and the balls of your feet on the floor, and if you're in a seated posture, feeling how the sit bones are supported by the cushion, by the bench. And then in order to lengthen and open, lengthen the spine and open the chest, let's inhale our shoulders up to our ears and then exhale them down our back. Doing that twice more, inhale, feeling the length. Exhale, opening the chest. One more time. We feel that delightful lift of the chest, almost as though the heart were slightly pointing towards the sky. And feeling a sense of our spine being both supple and strong. Inviting the chin to be slightly tipped forward. So if you choose to have your eyes open, then the gaze is soft and open in front of you. And if they're closed, really allow the eyes to feel soft and they're closed. Softening around the forehead, softening through the jaw. And finding a place for the hands to rest where the shoulders are at ease. So either on the sides or folded in the lap, or if there's another mudra that's supportive for you. Finding intentionality in the placement throughout the entire body, knowing that this is a posture for practice.
I'm taking a moment and really reconsidering that aspiration of non-harming and body, speech, and mind. And the invitation to let go or relieve whatever else has happened before, whatever else will happen after that wants or longs for our attention. Seeing if we can just release, soften around all of the worldly needs and desires. beginning our practice towards these three precious pills or what are sometimes called the three precious doors by settling our body in a natural state of stillness feeling and inviting this quality of stillness When the mind gets carried away, no problem with that non-harming kindness, just gently releasing whatever has captured attention. And then returning to this quality of stillness. With the stillness, a sense of unbounded sacred space may start to manifest and arise. As we notice and experience the stillness of the body, we feel the aliveness of the body. The spaciousness of the body. Yes, <clears throat> body of spaciousness, sometimes described as the body of light. Feel or imagine every single tiny cell in the body infused with light, aliveness.
And the more we settle into the body, feel this wonderful paradox of stillness and aliveness. The more we may notice areas that we're holding tension or tightness. No problem, no need to change or shift anything. Just continuing to feel and know the body, know its stillness, aliveness, and light from within the body. <laughs> and from the stillness, there may naturally already arise a bit of this quality of silence, silencing the inner speech. almost as though we were noticing that there are gaps in between the thoughts and ideas and fantasies and memories. And that we rest there. And if the mind feels very busy, it can be helpful to really focus on the breath and sustain attention through an entire inhale and exhale, allowing that inner speech some opportunity to settle even more deeply. with this foundation of stillness, spaciousness in the body, we may find through the silence of inner speech, there's a brightness of our awareness. Every single time we get carried away and return, we're further polishing the inner lens, clearly experiencing, seeing, and feeling the movements and the return, reestablishing ourselves every single time. And almost as though the natural blossom or flowering 
of our stillness and silence, this quality of, of warmth and openness. The mind in its natural state. As we settle the mind, it may feel almost as though we are lying down and gazing upon a limitless sky. I'm feeling very much at home and held within this gazing, this taking in. That's the warmth, the openness in union. A couple more moments here, feeling this manifestation of stillness, silence, and warmth and openness. Feeling it as within the body, but not limited to the body, within the mind, but unlimited to spacious awareness without boundary. Seeing if we can experience these qualities, even as the mind drifts or sounds or sensations arise. Notice that when we return, it's not as though we are recreating, we're just reorienting, rediscovering, unveiling the stillness, the silence, the warmth and openness that's always already here. <clears throat> the true inner refuge.
And then shifting our mind a bit, still established here in the stillness, silence, and openness, but inviting memory and imagination as we call out to this, this quality of fire. Maybe we sense that fire, like the warmth of the sun. Maybe we imagine flames. We'll see if we can feel, imagine, and call in a sense of vitality and joy. When we retrieve from the elements, we allow that part of us, which knows that element, to become more alive and present. There is part of us that is already like fire. Feel and imagine that warmth, that joy, that inspiration of fire and warmth. Invite that here, this moment, this body, this breath. We may practice going back and forth between using imagination to see the fire and warmth and then shifting back to the body to feel the fire and warmth. And if that becomes dimmed or dull, reigniting by imagining the fire once again. And in this way, see if we can sustain the sense of vitality, joy right here this body, this breath. If it's hard to imagine and feel, no problem. Keep practicing with that imagined feeling of vitality. And if it's present, just keep sustaining and re-engaging with this vitality and joy, nourishing the body, heart, and mind.
And we can allow this image of the fire to recede a bit. And instead allow ourselves to have that sense of spacious, open awareness, silence and stillness, but infused with the warmth, the residue of the joy and inspiration. If the mind, heart, and body want an anchor, you can gently focus on the sensations of breath. Otherwise, resting in spacious, open, warm awareness. Vast, expansive openness. Awareness around us in front of us, behind us, above us, and below us. And gently coming back and reestablishing presence more fully in the body. Feeling the feet, the sit bones, feeling the belly and the shoulders, the chest and the face. Feeling this human heart. Feeling all the human hearts here. Mm, the preciousness of these breaths. Thank you for your practice. You don't look that fiery, but I feel the fire. <laughs> so for folks in the room, 
we use this little microphone here <clears throat> so our friends online can hear us. And for friends online, just kind of like wave about and know. Jason, are you our host? Oh, oh my gosh, double duty. Impressive. Okay. So I would love to hear from folks. Any reflections, questions? <clears throat> How was that practice? We have some real three precious pill veterans in here now. We've been practicing this for maybe four or five months. Curious how that's going, how that's unfolding for you. Curious how fire felt. A little bit of a different quality than our water and our earth. Yeah, questions, comments. Yes, you let's see. Thank you. So for me, that was definitely more challenging and nothing like fire. <laughs> um, you know, sitting in the the silence or the stillness, it comes easy. But it, you know, for me, I was when we were talking about the campfire, that movement, that fire. It, it felt great, but it, I definitely didn't feel the heat. You didn't didn't feel <laughs> didn't feel the heat, or did, yeah, mm. in that sense. Interesting. In the sense that I didn't feel like um, I felt very peaceful and very calm, but just yeah. slightly different than than you know when we do the water or other practices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's interesting. I you know I always am so grateful. It feels like often the Dharma is kind of aligned with where my life is. And I got to experience a lot of joy last week. So I was like, oh, I got this fire thing. But two weeks ago, I might've been like, wow. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure if I'm, this practice is aligning for me so much this week because it's easy to feel. And I do think it's, you know, visualization, as I've mentioned before, like calling in these elements and calling in their qualities, it's, it's like if we're doing a loving kindness or a compassion practice. That we bring someone to mind and then it ignites that quality of care in us. With fire, it might just be harder, right? Like earth and water, they're very tangible, tactile, whereas fire is like a little bit at the visual level, a little more elusive. So it might also be interesting to try this practice with a candle flame, right? Uh, or a safely burning fire and see how that feels if we can kind of invite that quality in vivo thank you other questions or other reflections um so i find um that the natural state or the um expansive awareness there it's not naturally warm or mm. anything it's nothing and the, like if you say you know there um kind of open your mind to to sky well then it's there mm. open your mind or, or feel the warmth well then it's there but if the, if there is not that kind of yeah instruction there is no sky just nothing <laughs> yeah empty nothing no feeling just big nothing yeah yeah and i'm curious about that so can you can i ask you a couple things? yeah so with the nothing can you rest there like is yeah that, yeah and does it feel peaceful or is um it doesn't feel not peaceful okay it, yeah yeah um it doesn't it's I mean, that's it's very hard to describe it. Mm. It, doesn't, it doesn't feel um, restful or not restful. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, words are really hard. Maybe black, black, but not black as in the mood, but black certainly is the color. Mm. Black nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, I think there's, I'm curious because I think there is a, a spaciousness that can be really, you know, kind of, rich encompassing like wide vast but sometimes it can lack a little brightness you know like it can feel a little dull 
And then, so I think the brightness has a warmth in it possibly, which is kind of like, sometimes we think about the difference between spaciousness and awareness. And ideally that they, they're together. But if we just have the spaciousness, it could feel, but it's hard of course, because I'm not in your mind, um, but I wonder, that's a curiosity because sometimes they're even in that, what feels like this dark expanse, there's like this luminosity in it. There isn't okay brightness. Yeah, there is not that brightness. Yeah, so that might be interesting. I mean, again, it's not like I could tell you like go look for it, but it might be curious if because it's not just something we have in practice. You know that sense of spacious clarity without stop. Like it might just be with a cup of tea and let's not doing anything, and we're neither distracted nor not distracted, right? And there is that expansiveness, but we feel very clear. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So um, I was um, in the middle of fire all day long with a lot of people that were cranking up all that joyousness and yeah. a lot. And uh, so, but not now, I'm, I ran out of gas, right? <laughs> and, um, but uh, on a more subtle level, uh, when you were talking about fire, okay, so um, it's, it almost felt in my guts as a sense of, um, a, a humming, mm -hmm. some sort of a, 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 a low motor that mm. is working, a, mm. a, a, some level of vitality. It is not like, hey, yeah, you know, right. But 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 there is churning something, yeah. vibrating something. Yeah. Um, then you said you mentioned the word joyous, and then I was like, yeah, that sounds fun. Right. That I can I like to go there. Yeah. Right. I didn't stay there much long. Yeah. But I I could go back to the sense of like I'm alive. Yeah. Let's say. Yeah. You know there yes. is a, a liveliness. Yes. Some sort. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um. Nothing explodes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I love that that distinction and that um, specificity because I think. You know, I taught on New Year's Eve, some some folks were there and we did a practice around happiness and joy and a lot of people, and, and this is still very much the case, were like happiness and joy in this world right now, like you're asking me to do that. It can feel frivolous, right? So it's not the joy necessarily of like, I'm hedonically stoked, like everything's good. That's good, to, that can help with the fire but that's not the point of what we're cultivating. So I love this word liveliness, because no matter what we're doing, whether we are, you know, I've been thinking a lot about um, support for activists recently for obvious reasons. And, you know, you have to keep that liveliness. It may not feel like joy. You're doing really hard work. It's endless and yet we need that inspiration joy is the word that comes clear to me but it can also have a connotation of frivolity so thank you for that description and different than being around like all day you know that kind of expression yeah, yeah. though also nice right yeah. a lot of ways to light the fire yeah. yes thank you i had a really striking experience with this one um the, the phrase that you said, um, the fire is, you can stare at it and it's mesmerizing. It, it kind of triggered a series of experiences for me where the stillness was really an entry point. It took me a while to feel still, but I realized a lot of the day, I feel like I'm just so in it. I'm not even aware of what's happening. Mm. So the three pills have been such a gift stillness and the spaciousness and then when you brought in the bonfire i had managed to create a sense of spaciousness where i was not in a little like nub in of like tight attention but i was surrounded and that's where the i started having the feeling of 
well, I'm sitting here very still and spacious, but I'm in the fire. Mm. And the fire is all of these things that are like life and mm. work and things I want to do later and tasks are undone and all of these <laughs> things are, I, I realized I had the, the flash of all day in front of the computer screen. It's very mesmerizing, lights the fire. And that started being <laughs> like part of the bonfire. Mm. And at a moment of mild terror, mm. actually, because I was like, fuck, I'm in a bonfire. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to burn. Mm. Um, it was kind of, it was kind of intense, <laughs> but then I, I was still, and, and I, I realized I was, um, evidently had not turned to ash. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it kind of, I had this, this moment, it kind of hit me, uh, where when I go back into the body, I often think about the biology of the body. And I started thinking about how the fire is burning oxygen and every cell in my body has a little bonfire inside of it. Like the mitochondria literally are a little thing that's doing the same thing. <laughs> So I've got a billion fires inside of me. Mm -hmm. They're tiny, but of course I'm not going to catch fire because I'm literally am also fire. Anyway, I was I like that. Yeah. And I, I think it's experience. interesting though, the, um, the, the mild terror yeah. and it is, you know, fire is a, you know, it is an interesting one to work with. You could definitely have that with, with earth and with water as well. And yet there is something of that like danger, which is so interesting, like the discomfort possibly of getting too close and how that relates to inspiration, creativity. There's just, there's some charge there um, with that. And then I do love, you know, thinking of, of the bodies, right? Like what we contain in the body and this idea that we already are. I, I don't know if folks remember maybe two years ago with Chandra, we did this book where we almost all the meditations were imagine your body as like made up of little cells of light. And that's a very traditional healing therapeutic practice in Tibetan Buddhism as a way to truly like heal the whole body, imagining as these little points of light. So it's uh, mitochondria or otherwise. Yeah. And it's really, again, it's just this power of Attend, like bringing our attention and awareness towards what's already here. Such an amazing experience. I know folks have shared before that the stillness of the body paradoxically revealing the aliveness of the body. Yeah. Like that's a really powerful place to, to be and to feel. So, thank you. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, I like that when we do this, you, and today you explicitly said you, we're going to use our imagination. Hmm. We went from the three pills and then you're like, oh, we get to use our imagination now. And that's, to me, that's new in meditation. Meditation is hmm. normally just like watching, yes. observing and the awareness. So it's like, oh, I get to watch a movie. And it was very visual. Hmm. And um, before we started, you were talking a little bit about the bonfire when you're sitting around one, it's the center of attention. Yeah. And last year I was in the presence of somebody for a few days who was dying. Mm -hmm. It was a slow death. And um, it was like a bonfire in the room mm -hmm. where there was multiple, there were several of us family members talking about her, um, sharing um, good and bad about her mm. around her mm. for a few days. And there was long periods of quiet where but all the time we're just kind of looking at her mm. like that attention to a fire and her fire literally was was leaving yeah in that time mm. and then when you said to use your imagination the first thing that came up was uh my son at this um, party we went to in a friend's house in Bolinas, and there was a fire pit in the backyard and he was like six or seven and another kid about the same age, the two of them were like just like loving that fire pit, drawn to it, throwing everything they could into it, watching it, <laughs> watching it catch on fire. And it was kind of like this flip end of the, the fire of mm. uh, what I saw last year. And um, and then for myself, the imagination was just like the embers of a fire mm. towards the end of a mm -hmm. camping trip and you're watching, you know, they've had the roaring fire and yeah. it's like the glowing embers, but if you throw a piece of paper on it, it's going to catch on fire yeah. again. And it was all very visual. There was none of the 
the uh, physical feeling of warmth. But yeah. it's like this like little movie in my head. So it's, it's like, okay, this Super is Super interesting. Like, yeah. Using the imagination. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I do think it's really interesting visualization practice, which is so common in Vajrayana, but not in all traditions. And of course, in the Bond tradition here. And to use and like harness imagination for meditation, you're still paying attention, right? Like that, it, you know, it's not like we're just kind of off, you know, at recess, right? Like we're still doing the hard work of allowing our mind to focus and, and again, like polishing that inner lens, but we're doing so with this creativity and it is interesting what emerges and arises. You know, I think there can be this fine line with practice where these stories do arise and they can become so engrossing, they pull us all the way out of practice. But sometimes there is just this, it's like this ray of light that comes through this insight. Like that's so beautiful that she was like the fire in the room, right? And really just the kind of, it's like the beauty of this inner language that we, that we have. And I've definitely had that in practice where this insight arises that's just so clear and so searing. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah. Any other, Jimmy, can I ask you a question? Because you told me fire is the thing that like you need more of. Right. How'd that go? <laughs> <laughs> well, when we first started going through this book, um, before we even started meeting about it, I had, I had gotten it because I knew it was coming. And I was going through it and I was going through some of the practices and I was look, examining, you know, okay, which of these elements am I lacking and how is this working out? And it, it came to me really early on and very, very strongly and viscerally that fire was the element that I was lacking and that I wanted to practice with and I was shocked hmm. that that was the case hmm. because that's not been true for me most of my life hmm. most of my life that kind of joy bordering on exuberance was something that I had to keep in check. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, it, you know, I would get carried away. Yeah. And, um, but then I realized there were a series of events that happened over the last several years, culminating about three or four years ago, um, that really douse yeah. that. There are some things that happened in my life that really doused that. Mm. And I need to conjure that up mm. some more. So I started practicing with candlelight. Mm. And and I'm waiting for the weather to get clear so I can I can start up the fire pit in my backyard again and start utilizing that. Wonderful. And I've been going out in the sun whenever I can. And and it's and it's been um it's been really interesting mm. to me. Yeah. You know, that it, yeah, it's been very interesting to me. So thank you for asking. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Beautiful dedication to the practice. Yeah. And I, yeah. And we yeah, invite us around the fire pit. Yes. <laughs> it's been a long time. We've been at your house. <laughs> and, uh, or you can always meet at the beach. You don't have to do any cleanup after. Yeah. But, you know, I think it's interesting, you know, this book can act as a little bit of a, a diagnostic tool, right? And I do, I really like this idea of um, when we can have too much fire, right? And too much fire is like exhausting, you know? So we're around just like energy and excitement. And it is like, I, I relate to that um, over exuberance, right? And periods of my life in which like it, I can get so excited. You can really kind of lose track of your ground, right? Your earth quality, your water quality. It's just like this frenetic excitement. Um, I did want to read a little bit about how he describes fire here. And I, yeah, um, 
I, I truly don't have a deal with the publishing company, but I really recommend this book, even though we're going to be done with it in a week or two. Like, oh my gosh, I just, I can't, you know, I've read it now probably four times and it just, and it's short, right? But it continues to like, just lift up a lot. So he says, uh, da, da, da. the fire element brings an enthusiastic joy that is mentally wakeful and physically blissful. When the fire element is balanced, you are not only full of creative ideas, but you can initiate projects and bring them to fruition. You feel inspired in your work, whether alone or with others, you are engaged with life. When the fire element is blocked, you experience a lack of energy, inspiration, vitality. Your life can seem like a routine. Even if you have a good idea, your projects don't get off the ground. Imagine enjoying the dance of a lively bonfire. Do you feel a spark of that kind of liveliness when you engage with life? If not, your everyday life might be causing you to lose qualities of fire. Where do you feel this loss? In your family, at work, in your relationship with yourself? And how long have you had this? So yeah, Jimmy so beautifully described that kind of diagnostic. And it's interesting to think about, like, can we have a fire in one part of our life and like that dampening in another? I'm not convinced. <laughs> Maybe I'm just not a nuanced enough being, but I feel like when it's doused, it's doused, right? It's doused at home, it's doused at work, but I guess that is possible. Do folks here relate, maybe not now, but at some time in your life with that feeling of the fire being really dampened? Like not even embers, like I don't even know where it's buried under the sand. Yeah, and it's, it's really tough to like reignite. And it's interesting, you know, just as <clears throat> with like the earth element in which we're needing that sense of ground, we can literally go to the earth or there might be other practices that really support our grounding, either the meditation, maybe it's journaling, maybe it's dancing. Like there's not a specific thing, you know, of course here, what's being offered are these meditations and this way of kind of pondering and cultivating a relationship through imagination. But I really like thinking about kind of fire more broadly and how we falsely create our fire. So what do people do when they don't feel fire, but they need fire? Caffeine. That's right. <laughs> Number one, what else? What else? What else do we do? We don't have the fire, but we're trying to like make the fire. Sweets. Sweets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Turn up some music. Turn up some music. And like not, these are not like horrible, like maybe not too much sweets or caffeine, but not like horrible things, but it's like a false approximation. It's, and it can actually dull out our taste buds, right? So it's like having that, you know, extra spicy hot flaming Cheetos, no diss, but might be hard to then have like your quinoa kale bowl. Right. <laughs> Absolutely what I had for lunch. Um, totally delicious. Yeah, I'll mix it together. <laughs> but I feel like, you know, really getting like a taste for that inner fire, for that sense of creativity, that sense of joy. And, you know, all of this, especially in, in the container and, and the bigger context of Buddhist practice, this isn't for us. Like, it feels good. He said blissful, right? Like, I was like, underline that. Right? Okay, blissful. It's not for us. It has a very different quality of cultivating and kind of instigating joy if we're doing so with a greater intention. Yeah. That this joy is what fuels my work as an activist in the world, my work as a writer, my work as an artist, right? Like, so it's, and as a teacher, all the my amazing teachers in the room. So it's like, we need that. We actually, it's not like an optional, like, oh, I'll do that on vacation, <laughs> which is what I just experienced, but we should, <laughs> where, wherever you can get it, but we should really be trying to cultivate it, you know, and I, I actually had a, a meeting today with a colleague and I was saying, yeah, it was just amazing to feel truly like joy body, right? To feel joy in my whole body for a week, and she was saying, yeah, you know, I've been finding joy this week in these little pockets, like a conversation with an old friend. Mm -hmm. And she lives in a very cold part of the world. And so she was like, yeah, I walked outside 
today for 20 minutes and I was like oh god <laughs> I'm so, so glad I live in California um but just like where it's not necessarily like what you are doing again it can really help to ignite the flame to have conducive circumstances but like where can we actually alight our mind savor like such a beautiful huge body of research on savoring mm -hmm. and savoring gratitude practice is a very close relative of that we're actually noticing i'm taking a moment to let that sense of positive affect instantiate in us it's so easy to like we could move throughout the entire day and not notice these guys right not notice just the beauty of other beings um, I definitely got like cut off on my way here and felt that like I was cultivating joy on my ride. And then it was like, I was like, <laughs> it's so easy to kind of like lose it so quickly, but I think we can kind of string it together too. Right. So there's one thing to have like that sustained feeling over a day or a couple of days. Wonderful. We can always find it. There is an orientation there. I, I want to say another thing about fire, and this was inspired. I had a conversation with my dear friend, Jen, just the other day about fire and this practice. And it reminds me of this quality, this paramita, the sixth paramita in some traditions, which is virya, enthusiasm, mm -hmm. right effort, mm -hmm. right? And there's maybe a reason we call it like the fire of awakening. It's not like, oh, yeah, I should wake up and practice. And that's not going to work. <laughs> that's soggy, right? <laughs> that is not, not making its way anywhere towards awakening. And this, this quality, video or enthusiasm, I, I really, I don't know if folks remember when we were practicing together online, we did like the paramitas of practicing online. And one of the paramitas of practicing online was be so excited, even though we're on Zoom, right? <laughs> like we need that enthusiasm. Our practice actually, like if you're efforting your way through practice with discipline and endurance, you're not gonna make it very far. The joy, the creativity, that joyful enthusiasm for practice, it really, really matters and helps. And it's, it's interesting because in order to have that fire for practice, there has to be both joy and fear, like both joy and a little bit of like sadness, maybe, um, I don't know the right word, whatever the feeling is when you recognize the preciousness of this human life and that it is passing, right? I don't know if that's despair, urgency. I hate that word too, but it's, that's it. Right. And there's a, a writing from uh, Gillick Rinpoche exactly on that. Like, why are we not more urgent to wake up in our practice? Like, what are we missing? Like, all the signs are clear. And some of you may have heard of this term of practice like your hair is on fire. And that does not sound comfortable. Like, I can barely practice if I have an itch on my face. <laughs> like, how am I going to practice if my hair is on fire? Like, what are you asking? But this idea that we can really feel like that urgency that, you know, and it's, it's true. Like the world around us is on fire. Mm -hmm. It's on fire. Like there is so much suffering. There's not a choice we have. Like, what is it we can do? Like each of us every day, cultivate the heart and mind, right? For the sake of all beings. Mm -hmm. Cause there is a time for some of us that might be now when we're being called upon to act every day, and if it's not now, it's soon, right? Whether that's in our personal spheres or in our global sphere. And so that motivation, like the urgency has to come from the clear seeing of the world needs it. And the other thing that kind of dampens our fire is often pointed out in the teachings. So we get distracted by the false fire, by the flaming hot Cheetos, right? <laughs> we get distracted by a false approximation of vitality. Like we have our coffee, we listen to our loud music, we, you know, like, and we actually don't feel the liveliness, you know, that core liveliness, which though I love joy body and that excitement, it's not very clear. It's not very directed. Like, it, again, it can help fan the flames, but 
there's a really interesting way to think about this balanced level of joy that can then ignite that fire and not to get too caught up in the frivolity of our joy, you know, the hedonic joy as a way to meet the real sorrows. So for many of us, we feel tired or burnt out. Maybe we have more significant life events happening that are painful and difficult. And often the rewards we seek push us farther from the true refuge of our awakening. Just that amazing line from Shanti Deva: in our haste towards happiness, we destroy the very roots of that which could cause our happiness. Just that kind of like heedless move. Oh, I want to be happy. And then we're like tramping over, you know, these little seeds of our awakening that we've planted. So I think it's, um, it's like a very balanced one, this, this joy and like how we hold the fire, but that fire of awakening, practicing like our hair is on fire. We need that. And I love it. <clears throat> Gellick Rinpoche. And I remember the first time I heard a teacher say, you can wake up in this lifetime. And I was like, who are you talking to? I'm like me? It's like all of us. And it actually requires that kind of level of fire, a belief that we can. Not a guarantee, no guarantees, but this possibility. And, you know, waking up, the de definition that I love so much that my teacher shares with us is becoming more fully who you truly are. So not just like this transcendence from this world, but really being able to live into those qualities, which are naturally us, right? That stillness, that silence, that warmth and openness. If we meet others with those qualities, you're a Buddha, right? Like no matter what the situation is, no matter what the circumstance is. And I do think we can all do that. What do you think? possible yes. like if you have an hour of doing it you could have like two hours of doing it another time it's you know it's a huge commitment and that's why you know there has to be that fire and urgency because otherwise we put our spiritual path like to use another fire example on the back burner I like that one back burner. It's like low flame. Nothing's really cooking. It's just kind of like warming. <laughs> it's like never really going to get there. Right. So how do we get motivated that we need to focus as much of our life energy as is possible on this prospect of awakening? It requires we actually believe this is what's needed. This is what's required. This is what we can do. I cannot convince you of that. I can only, you know, suggest that it's a worthwhile inquiry. I feel it to be true. If there was another way, I would totally be teaching that. I wish there were, but I do think if that is what we want, if we want to have this ability to show up more fully for our own lives and for others, like we kind of got to practice like our hair is on fire because it's so easy to fall out and we practice like our hair is on fire it's not just like i'm sitting on my cushion all day and i've renounced everything it's really how we orient towards our life how do we see the difficulties how do we see the opportunities how are we holding them like what intention are we bringing and that naturally leads to us choosing things that are more and more aligned with awakening like it happens naturally as opposed to this like forced project. And yeah, it's, uh, it always brings up not only a deep longing for me, but also this sense of like overwhelm, like, oh my God, how am I going to do it? Like, how are we going to make the time? How are we going to, I do think it has to be in community. I don't think we can do this on our own. It's a too boring. <laughs> we lack accountability and responsibility. And, you know, showing, I, I, I don't know if you all feel this, but my practices here are very different than my practices at home. Mm -hmm. There's something that has been known in the traditions for thousands of years that practicing together, it, it matters. Yes, we can go to the cave, also a great place to practice. But when you're in the cave, you're imagining everyone. Mm -hmm. You actually have to have a very high level of practice to go to the cave and keep all of you with in your heart and mind. Um, 
this is definitely a start. Any questions or thoughts? I see Ben smiling online way over there. I can't believe I can see you. Hi. Comment in the chat. Is there a comment? Okay. Oh, can somebody unmute? Or they might be locked in there. Oh, okay. No comments. Oh, this one comment. I'm saying with rapid and urgency, I prefer that maybe compelling invitation. Mmm, compelling invitation. I like that. Mm hmm. Yeah. Anyone? Any thoughts or reflections on this invitation? Yes, Jen. Um. Yeah, thank you for the practice. I didn't think that um, I needed more fire. I was actually a little like nervous to do fire practice. Um, and what I experienced was a lot of uh, vitality, but also love. Hmm. And it got me thinking about um, the five elements in Chinese medicine. Hmm. And the element of the heart is fire. Hmm. Um, so anyway, I it just thought I'd put that out there mm. and um such a nourishing incredible powerful practice mm. and beautiful to be in the field with everybody yeah, yeah. welcome thank you <laughs> anyone else does the fire what is it with the compelling invitation to awakening what do you feel think hear about that I want to see Raph if anyone else anyone else so we can hear more voices in the room no. Okay, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, this this practice came at an interesting time for me because I have been feeling some sort of fire <laughs> for the last like month and a half, and it's been it's been tricky to navigate because, and now it's making more sense, mm. because it feels very urgent, very powerful, mm. but scary. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so it makes sense. People were talking today about like being drawn to this fire, but it's not like, yeah, we don't, we don't touch fire. Maybe we should, you know, we don't really know what to do with it. Um, so yeah, this, this has been, this was interesting to me. And more recently, I kind of realized how overwhelming the fire has been. Mm. And so I'm like navigating, like, how do I give myself the spaciousness I need to like chill out sometimes? Mm -hmm. And then maybe it will like guide me in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, it's interesting here in his little Paca theory where he's recommending, right? If there's too much fire, he really does recommend connecting with earth and water, mm. you know, and that we can really balance, you know, and give ourselves that titration that we need sometimes because that fire, right? Creativity or joy or inspiration, it makes sense. It can feel overwhelming. Like it's a lot of energy to hold. And especially, I don't know if folks have had here some of these experiences in meditation where you get a lot of that energy arising, that kind of quality of um, spiraling up energy. It can take, you have to kind of really have some capacity to hold the earth, hold the ground too. So yeah, glad this met you at the right time. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm a, a bit confused about sort of a, a yearning towards awakening mm -hmm. that feels like non-acceptance, like you're looking for something different. So I'm, and it, I guess I thought awakening had something to do with acceptance. So it's, I'm confused. Yeah. Um, I want to do that annoying teacher thing and ask you to say more though. Sorry. <laughs> like, what do you like? truly? Like, what do you think? Like what other words besides acceptance? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Because I think like a deep acceptance. Yeah. Acceptance though, like you can completely love and embrace yourself and want more. Right. Especially if you know, like aspiration, I think has a different quality than like, oh, you should. Because I do think where we really get stuck, especially in a lot of contemporary um, culture settings is well, you, sh you should do this and you should do that. And, and acceptance is such good medicine for that imposition of what we aren't doing. And that kind of, again, movement towards deficiency, like you're not enough, you should do more. But then with awakening, it's really, it's, it's inviting us to see, again, more fully who we are. And not to like, I need to do something, but I need to kind of like remove what's in between me and this more essential nature of who I am. And so when you get a glimpse of that, like, oh, I really feel that sense of if I could rest in this spaciousness, in this compassion, in this care, I could be so much more available. And so you, you aspire to that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very supportive of acceptance and the vidya and also the discipline is needed, right? Like, so it's, it's really always about the balance between the acceptance, that loving embrace, you know, the 999 arms of compassion. Some of them are like a sword cutting through. And then some of them are the kind of teapot. Like I would think that's more like the acceptance, like come, like be, be well. So, yeah. And I'd be curious how that will land with you and how that kind of, yeah, how it feels taking that idea in and reflecting on that. Because I think embracing acceptance is absolutely necessary, like to be part of the fabric of actually how thoughts and ideas land in us, that we can have that kind of loving, I would even just say compassionate, right, way of being with it. And the fire of awakening, it's not denying that what we are now is already beautiful. And in, in the Vajrayana tradition, everything we're already awake we just need to get rid of stuff it's not even a destination we're going to it's already here but there's like yeah there's some dust on the gold right need to kind of clear it up oh yeah okay jason I like your spooky vibes there with the yeah I'm, uh, i've got my <laughs> My fire. <laughs> nice. And um, but you know, one of the things that I noticed was, and I've been noticing this today, is when I feel fire, which I would define as creative flow or urge, it often makes me feel like I want to move away from where I am, and I'm having mm. a hard time with that. I had a lot of hard time. I, I was feeling the whole time like just stay with the breath, just stay with the breath. So. Mm. The, the sort of sense of like um, wanting to move it was super powerful. And I'm curious if you have a way of kind of framing that. Cause I, I one thing that was helpful was sitting around a fire, that feeling yeah. of like, you don't want to go in, there's nothing else around, that's it. Um, so that's helpful. But I'm just wondering if you could kind of comment on how to, cause I've always used, um, I've had to restrain creativity in my meditation because mm -hmm. it tends to take me away from the practice. It, 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 it's like, pew, I'm like off in this little, I'm basically going elsewhere. And so curious to see if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, my, my immediate hit, and I'll, I'll be then curious to see if this shows up for you well in practice is when you say you go like over there, that is, that's somewhat, you're, you're leaving the body right? That's kind of a more mental train. So I wonder, you know, that kind of grounded quality of being with the essence of fire while still in the body, if that could help you experience the creativity without getting totally carried away. And that's unusual. Like most of us are quite cognitive, mental dominant. Like when we think of creativity, we think. So what is it like to feel that in the body? It could be a really interesting investigation. Yeah. Okay. Well, wonderful friends with our hair on fire. Let's dedicate the merit of our practice.
So really bringing ourself and our attention, our awareness back to the body and breath. And noticing any residue of sensations in the body associated either with fire or curiosity, connection, just whatever is here and present. <laughs> And if it feels comfortable and appropriate, placing hands together as a gesture of offering at the heart center. As a reminder that we do this practice with the hope and intention that some part of our energy we are engaging with could be of benefit. And we dedicate this energy that all beings would be healthy and safe, that all beings could know peace and ease, that all beings everywhere could be free. Oh, wonderful to be with you all.